Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to defend your company against false advertising with some uh, takeaways at the end for avoiding false advertising claims as, also, as well as some litigation tips. Uh, I'll be conducting the webinar along with my colleague, Rachel Kaposha. Uh, I'm a trial attorney. I focus on uh, uh, complex patent cases as well as cases involving technology and uh, about the company entertainment cases. And Rachel, if you want to uh, introduce yourself as well. Good afternoon, everybody. I am a intellectual property uh, attorney who does lots of cases related to different kinds of technology-based things, including patent cases and copyright and all kinds of technology things. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and jump on in. If, if people have questions, please go ahead and feel free to uh, type them into the little question box. We'll take them as we go and we'll have some time left over, hopefully at the end to answer questions in addition to those. Um, so today we're gonna talk about what is a false advertising claim. And we're gonna break it into the uh, little areas that you see here, applicable laws for false advertising, uh, the Lanham Act and different state laws, uh, elements of false advertising claims, remedies for false advertising, and then we'll talk about some key takeaways, as I mentioned before. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So starting in general, what is, a fa what is false advertising? Uh, it, it generally involves a competitor advertising uh, itself or other claims about its products that are false or misleading. Uh, and you may have a claim under the Lanham Act, which is Section 43A, uh, we think of that sometimes as a trademark statute, but it also involves false advertising. And there's various state laws that protect against false advertising uh, under unfair competition. Some are specifically uh, directed to false advertising in various states. Uh, California has one. And then there's other general, false, uh, general unfair competition laws that will usually apply in various states. Uh, it applies, the false advertising laws applies to situations of comparative advertising and also non-comparative. You probably, we're gonna talk quite a bit about comparative advertising where one competitor uh, compares their product in a false or misleading way with another's product. Uh, but there also are situations where a competitor may uh, falsely or misleadingly advertise their own product and that can result in a false advertising claim. And if we can have the next slide. So one of these, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna show some examples. Uh, you may be familiar with this one. This is the Jack in the Box uh, advertisement uh, with respect to, to Hardee's and uh, Carl's Jr. that led to a false advertising lawsuit. Okay, listen up, this is big. We have just launched the first 100% sirloin burger in fast food history. Take a look. That's 100% ground sirloin seasoned while it cooks. People can choose what kind of cheese and onions they want, but it's the sirloin that has to be tasted to be believed. Now, for those of you not from Texas, that's the sirloin area. Jack, our competitors serve Angus burgers. Could you point to the Angus area? I'd rather not. And that led to a false advertising claim. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, uh, they, were, they were projecting a part of the cow that uh, wasn't a true statement of, of where the meat was coming from. Um, some of the statements they made about 100% sirloin, as long as those were true, that would be fine. Uh, but you can see where you can get into some trouble, as, as we'll talk about later, are some of the comparative advertising. And uh, that, that ends up being one of my favorite all-time advertisements, but uh, it did get pulled down. And, and unfortunately, uh, there's, there's not a an exception in false advertising law for humor. Uh, so, Rachel, if you want to want to take it from okay, there. Listen up. Oops, sorry about that. Um, these are some examples of some other false advertising scandals that have come up over the years. Um, the first one is Activia yogurt. I know maybe maybe many of you remember the old Activia yogurt ads with Jamie Lee Curtis, which talked about how Activia was supposedly clinically and scientifically proven to boost your immune system and help regulate digestion. Um, that turned out not to be true, and Dannon ultimately settled a class action lawsuit for $45 million related to Activia yogurt. Um, the second one here up in the right-hand corner of the screen is the uh, Red Bull gives you wings promotion. Now, Nobody thought that Red Bull actually gave you wings, but Red Bull went on to claim that by giving you wings, what they meant was that Red Bull, a highly caffeinated uh, product, could improve a consumer's concentration and reaction speed. 
these also proved not to be true, and Red Bull ultimately settled their consumer class action about that issue for $13 million. Um, another one was uh, another uh, class action related to Splenda. Uh, as you all know, there's the um, pink, blue, and yellow no calorie sweetener products that everybody sort of has their, uh, their favorite. Splenda came out and claimed that it's made from sugar, so it tastes like sugar, as it says here in this ad. Um, they were sued by the people who make um, one of the other ones, I can't remember which one, and proved that Splenda is not actually made from sugar, but is a highly processed chemical compound made in a factory, just like the other non non sweeteners are. Um, they were sued by, uh, actually by equal for $200 million and settled that case for an undisclosed sum. And then finally, the last one I wanted to mention was this Olay issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this ad, Olay claimed that their definitive, their Definity eye cream can give you younger looking eyes and included this picture of the model from the 60s, Twiggy. In this picture, Twiggy's 60 years old, and as you can see, she's lovely and wrinkle-free. Um, people took, uh, were upset with this ad in England and raised concerns about it, claiming that she had been digitally altered, and apparently Twiggy doesn't actually look precisely like this anymore. It turned out the ad was actually digitally altered and ultimately the ad had to be taken down in Great Britain. Now, there was no money changed hands and there, there wasn't a lawsuit, this was a regulatory issue, but it is something to think to keep in mind that I think there's an awful lot of ads that we put out here where uh, the only thing really done to them is to digitally alter the way people look. That's a fairly common thing to do at these advertisements. In this one, it actually mattered because they were claiming that uh, Twiggy, the 60 year old lady, could look like basically a 20 year old in this picture by using the Olay definitive eye cream, if only. All right, so that sort of takes us into a little more depth of what a false advertising claim is. So the Lanham Act is what we're going to focus on, on for the most part for today, and that's where you see most of the cases coming out of. Uh, so the, the Lanham Act permits private parties to obtain civil remedies for deceptive food labeling. And there were some well-known cases involving Palm, uh, and one of those cases, uh, Palm sued a number of different companies for uh, saying that they were trying to compete with Palm by alleging that their juices contained more pomegranate juice than they did. So one of those was the Coca-Cola case, uh, and Palm had some of the, the juices tested, and from their testing showed that the uh, juices contained less uh, pomegranate juice than was represented. So they were able to establish a false advertising case under the Lanham Act. This case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, on the issue of whether uh, it was up to the FDA to regulate statements made about food products. And the Supreme Court uh, said, no, the, the Lanham Act uh, is something that does not conflict with the, the act that empowers the FDA and they're compl complementary and therefore the, the cases could proceed. Um, so that kind of gives you an overview as to the strength of the Lanham Act in the false advertising context. Much of the Supreme Court's focus in this opinion uh, was about how the two acts were complementary because under the Lanham Act, competitors are able to bring these suits against each other, which according to the Supreme Court creates another level of regulation where competitors, you probably understand how some of these things work more than anyone else can come forward in these cases. Um, this case was eventually remanded back to the district court here in the central district and tried to a jury who found in favor of Coca-Cola in the case. Um, in the next section, we're gonna talk just a little bit about what are the applicable laws for false advertising. As Stan mentioned previously, section 43 of the Lanham Act covers false advertising as well as trademark infringement. It's very, uh, it has a lot of uh, things packed into this one section of the act. Um, there's also many state laws that address false advertising and unfair competition. In California, there's all of its slate of unfair competition laws like um, Business and Professions Code Section 17200. There's California's false advertising 
Act, which is Business and Professions Code 17500. There's also numerous torts that people allege, as well as Lanham Act and unfair competition claims, such as tortious interference or intentional interference with business advantage and things like that. Um, many of the same elements are required in all of these cases. A lot of the, you have to prove a lot of the same things. So in this presentation, as Sam mentioned earlier, we'll focus on the Lanham Act, which gets to most of what you have to prove. <clears throat> um, this is the text of the section of the Lanham Act that we're talking about, which notes that when any person in connection with any good or service uh, in any way, such as on the container of the goods or services or in any other way, uses any word or symbol or whatever that's false or misleading description of fact or a false or misleading representation of a fact that is likely to cause confusion by consumers or to deceive somebody with the, the affiliation of the product or anything like that, or that in commercial advertising or promotion misrepresents the nature, characteristics, quality, or geographic origin of the goods or services shall be liable in a civil action. So as I said, section 43 of the Lanham Act covers a lot of different things in it, but included in that is this notion that you can't have false or misleading representations of fact in commercial advertising or promotion. Um, in the next section, we'll talk a little bit about what the elements are for false advertising claims. Do you want to take this one, Stan? Sure. So the elements of false advertising are pretty straightforward. Um, there is some litigation over different ones of these, which we'll get into as we, as we get into the, this a little bit more detail. Um, the first is that there has to be a false or misleading statement as to either your own products or another's, another products. And it's important that that false or misleading statement can be made. It doesn't have to be a comparison. It can be made about your own product all by itself without ever referencing anyone else's product. Um, there needs to be actual de deception or at least a tendency to deceive a substantial portion of the intended audience. And the deception needs to be material in that it will likely influence a purchasing decision. So there has to be an impact on the consumer and uh, for there to be federal jurisdiction, of course, there, the advertisement has to be for a good that travels in interstate commerce, and there needs to be a likelihood of injury to the plaintiff. So generally, uh, the plaintiff doesn't have to establish actual injury, but they need to establish some form of harm. And if there's, if there's competition between the plaintiff and the defendant, um, that's probably going to be enough uh, one way or another to establish a competitive uh, or actual in, uh, some some sort of harm, even if it doesn't rise to the level of actual injury, and we're going to talk about some examples of that as we get going. So there's two types of advertising that are claims that are actual under the Lanham Act, as we mentioned. There's statements that are literally false, and statements that are literally true but likely to mislead, confuse, or deceive. So the literally false ones are a little easier to understand. If someone makes a statement about how much juice they have in a product, for example, um, and you can prove that it's, it's scientifically not correct, then that's gonna be a literally false statement. The literally true, but likely to mislead or uh, confuse or deceive get a little more complicated, and we'll provide some examples. S specific claims of false objective facts are certainly these are e the ones that are easier to prove. Um, but you have to remember that, that statements of opinion or statements of general superiority are not going to be actionable. They're going to be considered puffery. Um, but recovery on a superiority claim is possible if the challenge advertisement directly compares to a competitor's product. So if there's a, a basis, uh, we'll talk some about the uh, Pizza Hut Papa John's case which led to um, some, some litigation where there's a basis that, that one of the competitors can say they're comparing our product and they're making a statement that their product is superior to ours. And that's an objectively factual statement that can be challenged. So those are the different types of false advertising that, that can occur um, and that can be actionable under the Lanham Act. Generally, statements that are just things like king of beers, you know, things that are not measurable are probably puffery. Um, I'm going to play you another uh, 
another advertisement that has statements in it that are literally true, but potentially misleading. And we're gonna go back to Super Bowl 2019. My king, this corn syrup was just delivered. That's not ours. We don't brew Bud Light with corn syrup. Miller Light uses corn syrup. Let us take it to them at once. But if something did happen, we'd eat the wizard first, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, brewers of Miller Lite, we received your corn syrup by mistake. That's not our corn syrup. We received our shipment this morning. You're joking. Try the Coors Light Castle. They also use corn syrup. <sighs> Can you smoke outside? of Coors Light. Is this corn syrup yours? Well, well, well. Looks like the corn syrup has come home to be brewed. <laughs> to be clear, we brew Coors Light with corn syrup. Ah. Bud Light. Brewed with no corn syrup. Okay, so if you remember this ad from a couple of years ago, this led to um, a long litigation between Molson Coors and Anheuser-Busch about brewing their beers with corn syrup or not. Now, as everybody knows, corn syrup is considered a you know, particularly vile ingredient in any product. And so Bud Light making this point in this ad makes it sound like uh, these other beers have corn syrup in them when their product does not. In reality, all of these beers have to include some kind of sweetener during the fermentation process. But uh, Miller Lite and Coors do actually use corn syrup during the fermentation process, but no corn syrup actually ends up in the final beer. Bud Light, by contrast, uses rice syrup instead of corn syrup. So there's there's really no health difference. Experts said there's really no nutritional difference between using rice or corn as a source of the sugar in the fermentation process. So this led to a um, false advertising claim where you know the issue was that this wasn't really false, but it did have a misleading implication. Um, originally, uh, the uh, Bud Light folks won, excuse me, lost at the district court level, but the Seventh Circuit handed them a victory in May of 2020, finding that the beer labels uh, actually say, the beer labels of Molson and Coors beers actually say that they contain corn syrup. So that even if the Bud Light ads infers that corn syrup is in the beer, the packages yield the same inference. The opinion written by Judge Easterbrook went on to say that if you're unhappy about the sneering nature of your competitive ads, then you should just make your own your own funny ad in return. <clears throat> um, in the case, in that Seventh Circuit case, the court didn't consider at all consumer per perceptions here, but based it all on what it actually said on the labels of the two competitors' products. My king, this court. If something did happen. We need. Sorry about that. So that leads us to what constitutes a commercial advertisement or promotion. Um, the Lanham Act doesn't provide a definition of, of either of those terms, but the terms have been construed very broadly. Um, so in addition to obvious advertisements that you'd be familiar with on television or the internet, um, the advertisements, uh, advertising or promotion can include labeling, certainly internet advertising, uh, even sales presentations to a, a group of, of customers or potential customers. Uh, can be considered advertising or promotion. So it really gets down to focusing on what the speech is designed to influence. Is it, is it looking to influence a customer uh, or a consumer to purchase something? If it is, then it's likely to constitute a commercial advertising or promotion. So all this is a, a typically a factually specific inquiry. Uh, it, it does result in a, a major battle between the parties at times as to whether this is really intended to be an advertisement or a promotion. There's several different areas in which courts apply presumptions, particularly when something is shown to be literally false. So there's a presumption that a literally false advertisement is materially deceptive. Um, and a plaintiff is entitled to relief under the Lanham Act on proof of literal falsity alone, as a court will assume that false statements actually misled consumers. Without that, you've got to go and do consumer surveys and things like that. But in these cases, it can just be presumed. Um, as Stan mentioned earlier, Palm Wonderful has brought a ton of cases that have worked their way through the federal courts against a lot of different, um, against a lot of different 
competitors. Um, in this case, Purely juice claim that its juice was 100% pomegranate juice with no added sugar. Neither of those things proved to be true. And ultimately, Palm Wonderful was able to obtain a victory in this case over that. So as Stan said, if you're going to say your product is 100% pomegranate juice with no added sugar, be careful. It, it, uh, make sure that that's true if it's actually measurable. So those are the easier cases for a plaintiff to pursue, um, particularly with the assumption of, of materiality or the presumption of materiality, if there's a false statement. Uh, it's, a, it's much more difficult to prove the deceptive or likely deceived cases. Um, they, they face a higher burden and they're going to usually need some form of extrinsic evidence, uh, which are often consumer surveys. And that is much more similar to what you see in trademark cases and consumer surveys can be difficult to, to establish and to do the right way. So it's important if you're going to be pursuing one of these cases to understand that you're going to need, a, likely going to need a consumer survey and you're gonna to have to make sure that survey is done right. Um, on the defense side, you will probably wanna do uh, a survey but you don't have to and you can just rely on attacking what the plaintiff's done. So um, it, it does create an added burden if there's not a false statement, but just something that's likely to see. Um, some courts have, have held that you don't need the extrinsic evidence if uh, the defendant's Lanham Act violation is willful or in bad faith, uh, but that's really the exception. So, and, and those are also hard things to prove. So you just have to keep in mind that if you're going to be pursuing a deceptive or likely to deceive case, it's going to be uh, more difficult and you're going to have a higher burden to meet. As we noted, one of the elements is that this has to be in interstate commerce, but as is true for federal antitrust claims, a plaintiff doing business in the United States will almost certainly satisfy this element from the Lanham Act. And then the competitive or commercial injury in terms of is, is another factor. And in terms of obtaining injunctive relief, a, a plaintiff needs only to show the threat and injury, the actual injury isn't required. So in a situation where uh, you're dealing with a comparative advertisement and the uh, defendant is, is making a false statement about the plaintiff's product, um, that's gonna be something that, that even if it's just getting started, the plaintiff's not gonna need to come forward and show actual injury, the threat that the defendant could make a false statement about the plaintiff's product is, is going to be enough to satisfy this prong for purposes of injunctive relief. But that's a little bit different for the Lanham Act in terms of damages. In that situation, a plaintiff is going to have to show some form of factual harm from the alleged, from the challenged advertisement or statement. So the, uh, they don't have to show that they've suffered actual uh, losses in the form of lost profits that they can quantify those. It's enough to show that there is some harm, that there's some sort of injury to the plaintiff, that they're, they're losing customers, even if they can't quantify the, the amount of those customers or what the damages are. Um, so, but you do need to show some sort of factual harm. Um, and keep in mind that the, the false advertising, it doesn't have to be a direct competitor. Um, that's not a requirement of the Lanham Act. It's just an easier situation to establish that harm. If there is a direct competition, the, the harm is going to be more likely and easier to infer. Um, but regardless, the plaintiff is going to have to show some lost sales or, or loss of business reputation that, that is being caused by the false advertisement in order to obtain some sort of damages. So it's a little bit of a heightened requirement over what would be necessary to obtain injunctive relief. In this case that went to the Supreme Court, Lexmark versus static control components, static control components sold microchips that were necessary for refurbishing Lexmark toner cartridges. They were not a direct competitor with Lexmark. That was the companies that actually made these or that referred to refurbish the toner cartridges, but they were still able to bring, to obtain relief, even though they were an indirect competitor. We're gonna talk next about the remedies for false advertising. Um, to start with, the remedies for false advertising include, under the Lanham Act, include an injunction, a preliminary injunction or a permanent injunction, 
plaintiff's actual damages in the form of lost profits, defendant's profits, so disgorgement of defendant's profits attributable to the false, the false advertising, and attorney's fees in some instances. So in terms of injunctive relief, that's often in these uh, comparative advertising cases in particular that we've been talking about. That's often a, a plaintiff's primary goal is to get the injunctive relief. So uh, when you're dealing with, with hamburgers, the damages aren't really what they're worried about. That's going to that's gonna be very hard to quantify, but the, the harm that could come about from consumers not understanding what part of a cow, a hamburger patty is being made from could be significant. Uh, and it's fairly obvious that that, that that could cause a lot of harm, going to be hard to quantify it. Um, so they're going to want to get an injunction in those situations. And, and that's true of really a lot of these cases where you see uh, competitor versus competitor, comparative false advertising going on. So for the preliminary injunction, the uh, plaintiff is still going to need to show irreparable injury and the likelihood of success in the merit. So they're going to have to come forward with some evidence that the, the statement is false or true, but likely to mislead. Um, you know, more likely that the injunction is going to be granted in situations where the statement's false and someone can come forward and show that a particular representation of a product uh, can scientifically be shown to be untrue. Uh, it's going to give you a, a leg up on the uh, likelihood of success on the, on the merits and probably on irreparable injury as well, because that's uh, certainly if it's about, if it's a comparison advertisement and your product as the plaintiff is being misrepresented, um, that's going to likely lead to a, a finding of irreparable harm. So the comparative advertisements identifying the competitor by name will even presume irreparable harm in that situation because it's so clear uh, that the courts will say there's a presumption of it for purposes of injunctive relief. So in those, in those situations where you have the comparative advertisements and it's a false false statement that can be scientifically shown to be false, your likelihood of getting an injunction increases significantly. Um, to collect damages under the Lanham Act, for plaintiff to recover its lost profits, it has to show actual injury and loss of profits attributable to that injury. Um, this is the code section 15 USC section 117A. This is the section of the Lanham Act that provides for damages. It also includes a provision for enhanced damages in certain situations. Um, it states that in assessing damages, the court may enter judgment according to the circumstances of the case for any sum above the amount found as actual damages, not exceeding three times such amount. Um, there's a lot of cases in this area and there's a lot of different ways that courts consider whether to enhance damages in these cases. As it said, it's based on the circumstances of the case and often can be in cases where you see a really egregiously um, false advertisement, but a plaintiff who's unable to show readily uh, lost profits that seem commensurate with an amount that makes sense to the judge to be the actual damages in the case. And so in those cases, the statute provides specifically that the judge has the ability to enhance the damages in those situations. Now, in terms of disgorgement of a defendant's profits, which is a, a very significant remedy uh, and one that plaintiffs will, will choose in addition to their own lost profits or maybe in lieu of their own lost profits, the proof of actual injury is, is not required to obtain disgorgement. Um, you still need to show, as we note there, that you uh, have some harm, as we've talked about, but you're not required Images and their separate recoveries, in fact. So the Lanham Act specifically provides that the plaintiff can simply prove the defendant's um, gross profits, and then it's up to the defendant to prove any deductions um, from those profits and to show that the profits are not attributed to the false or misleading advertising. So it, it gives a uh, very powerful weapon to plaintiffs to go and show that they have suffered harm and that they, even though they don't have actual injury, they can't quantify their lost profits, but they've shown that they've suffered some harm 
they can get a disgorgement of the defendant's profits and then put the burden on the defendant really to prove um, what the costs are to, to show what portion of the profits are attributable to the false misleading advertising, which puts a lot of burden on the defendant. Um, and then the, the court can adjust the award. If the court finds that the amount of recovery uh, is either inadequate or excessive, the court can enter a judgment that's, that's for a different amount. And so this makes it a more of an equitable remedy where the court has some oversight. Um, but once you've gone through a jury trial, uh, in most cases, the judge is probably going to go with what the jury did, not in all cases, but a lot of the time that's what's going to happen. So it's important that um, as a plaintiff and a defendant, you don't rely on this provision, but that you really pay attention to, uh, if you're the plaintiff, establishing the, the false advertising, establishing the defendant's uh, gross revenue. And then the defendant has to be very careful to make sure it sets forth what its uh, costs were in detail so that it can have those deducted uh, in the event that it's found to have falsely advertised. Otherwise, the, the plaintiff could be left with a, a much bigger recovery um, and you don't wanna be in the position of having to argue to the court that it should be reduced um, it, it, for some other amount that the court finds to be just under the circumstances. In addition, it's clear from the way the statute is worded that both disgorgement and actual damages are separately recoverable. So you, you can get both, it's not either or, um, but you can also ask for just one or the other. You don't have to, you don't have to establish both. And in circumstances where it's difficult to establish proof of actual damage, that in those cases, um, disgorgement may be the more uh, reasonable remedy for the defendant or excuse me, for the plaintiff. For the defendant uh, in disgorgement situations, another area that they really are gonna focus on too, in addition to their cost, is any arguments they wanna make about the, the uh, damages not being based, not being attributable to the false or misleading advertising. So looking for other things that may explain what led to the harm. Uh, as I was stating a moment ago, uh, disgorgement is particularly appropriate when proof of actual damages is difficult. Um, the plaintiff still has to prove that some harm occurred as a result of the false advertising, but is not put to the test of having to prove its actual damages. Um, courts have looked at this, come at this remedy from a lot of different ways and have considered awards of defendants' profits based on theories of unjust enrichment, deterrence, and compensation, looking that at the point that even if it's difficult for the injured competitor to prove their lost profits coming from this, this conduct, it should nonetheless be, uh, there should be some deterrence portion in trying to keep people from, or competitors from using faults advertising and from just doing it over and over again, if it, if it simply is hard for their competitors to prove what their damages might be from that, that advertising. Um, in addition, there's at least one case we found where the court considered the systemic market distortion caused by a wrongdoer's false claim. And that was in this case of Alpo Pet Foods versus Ralston Purina, which was in DC. Um, in this case, uh, at that time, Ralston Purina, I think these companies are all owned by the same company now, but at that time, Ralston Purina put out puppy chow that they claimed could prevent canine hip dysplasia. Now, the court in this case, uh, hearing this case on remand from the DC circuit, the district court was clearly a dog owner and a dog lover and was quite outraged by the cruel hoax on dog owners that Ralston Purina had perpetrated. Um, these are pictures of my dogs. And if you look in their eyes, I think you could see that, that the, the cruel hoax on dog owners could be particularly cruel in, in situations where you've got so many people in this country who are dog lovers, including this judge. He went on to talk about how in a highly competitive dog food market, um, the increase that Ralston gave, gained by claiming that their puppy chow had this benefit uh, necessarily came at the expense of its competitors. And even though it was difficult for its competitors to establish exactly uh, that their lost profits were based on this falsity. The court felt that because of 
a dis this distortion in the market by having someone believe that this one puppy chow had this benefit that others did not have, um, that the false campaign was an affront to the market as a whole, cementing the dominance of a single company while permanently damaging the ability of any competitor or competitors to challenge for the lead position. Like I said, I think this judge was definitely a dog lover. So one of the things that has become uh, clear over the last year is that there's no longer requirement of willfulness in order for a plaintiff to obtain disgorgement of defendant's profits. Um, there was a split among the circuits and uh, the Supreme Court resolved that split uh, last year in a, in a very significant case and finding that willfulness is not required toward uh, profit disgorgement under the Lanham Act. So um, that's no longer an available uh, defense. A lot of defendants had said, well, you can't get disgorgement because we didn't intend to, to make these false statements. We, um, uh, we didn't know they were false or whatnot. That's not gonna, gonna cut it anymore. It may, it may help in front of the jury uh, in, in general to show that you weren't a bad actor as jurors may take that into consideration, but you're not gonna get a jury instruction anymore as a defendant requiring a plaintiff to prove willfulness. So that was a pretty significant uh, ruling in terms of what's required to obtain disgorgement of defendant's profits. Uh, this case that was at the Supreme Court, Red Mag Fasteners versus Fossil Group, uh, was related to trademark infringement, I believe. And uh, the court didn't specifically talk about false advertising in the case, but uh, the same parts of the statute apply to uh, false advertising as they do to trademark infringement. And most courts and cases have applied them the same across those different areas. I don't know if any case had actually applied this in, in the area of false advertising yet, but I'm certain that will happen soon. Um, the Lanham Act does also include a statement when discussing uh, damages after both of the damages uh, descriptions, it says that such sum in either of the above circumstances, i.e. related to either lost profits or disgorgement, shall constitute compensation and not a penalty. Um, this is vexing language that's a little bit hard to understand from the cases of what constitutes compensation and not a penalty. As we mentioned before, the cases do look at a lot of different bases for um, finding, uh, for example, disgorgement, including deterrence and unjust enrichment and things like that. Um, in addition, the court has the ability to enhance, enhance or um, or detract from the awards in different cases. So again, this is all just another way of saying that this is this statute is really uh, a type of equitable remedy that gives the court a lot of leeway in determining how to go about um, setting forth what, uh, what awards will be or determining whether the awards are proper. <clears throat> uh, finally, after after this section, the act then provides that the court in exceptional cases may award reasonable attorney fees to the prevailing party. <clears throat> so that takes us through the elements of false advertising. And now we wanna talk about some of the, the key takeaways from those and, and some of the different cases that we've reviewed and, and some of the things we've learned litigating false advertising cases as well. Um, so it's important if you're in a comparative situation, if we go to the next slide, um, that you're very cautious in terms of how you're doing it. Comparative advertising is okay, uh, but you do want to be very careful in, in terms of what you're saying. Uh, these are the easiest cases for a competitor to, to, make, a, to make a case. Um, the presumptions are much easier for, for showing uh, materiality in terms of false statements and also for showing damages. So it's, it's likely gonna be a lot easier for a competitor in, in a competitor versus competitor situation for there to be injunctive relief as well. So there should definitely be comparative advertising. That's not the problem. You just have to be very careful. And it's important to, if you're making any kind of objective uh, claim about a, another competitors products or you're making an objective claim comparing your two products that you're very careful in what you say and that it's accurate and backed up. Uh, 
um, as part of that, you want to be careful about making definitive, measurable statements unless you have verified that they're true. So remember, puffery probably isn't actionable, things like king of beers, best tasting burger, things like that. But once you start saying things like, this is 100% grape juice, then you want to make sure that it is because your competitors will certainly go and, and figure out whether it is or not and then can come and bring these cases. Um, another area that has come up quite a bit, both in the false advertising context and then also just in the regulatory context, are all of these products making health claims. Um, as we've pointed out, Palm Wonderful has been at the center of a lot of these cases. Palm has sued a lot of other companies claiming that their uh, pomegranate products don't have the amounts of pomegranate that they claim they have. And in many of those cases, the companies have fought back by pointing out that uh, Palm has unclean hands because they have claimed over and over again that their Palm Wonderful juices and supplements um, can treat, prevent, or reduce the risk of heart disease, prostate cancer, and erectile dysfunction. So when these claims were finally, the FTC came and uh, undertook a regulatory proceeding against Palm related to these claims and determined that Palm Wonderful really can't treat, prevent, or reduce any of these kinds of diseases. Uh, this case ultimately uh, coming in from the DC circuit ultimately agreed with the FTC that uh, advertisements like this one here, cheat death uh, with, by drinking Palm Wonderful uh, had to be taken down. And they barred Palm from making any such claims about these kinds of benefits in the future unless supported by specific scientific evidence. So again, watch out for this, because this has been a lot of the cases we've seen, like, for example, the um, uh, Red Bull gives you wings case was also related to them making some kind of health related benefits related to Red Bull. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I think we have one, um, one question, Rachel, I'll, I'll let you handle this one with the cheating death by itself. Um, do you think that would constitute a, a problem under the Lanham Act or, would, or the FTC, which we haven't talked about as much? We've been focusing on more on the, the Lanham Act, but would the FTC, do you think, have a problem with that? I don't think they'd have a problem with just cheap death because, again, it's just a kind of puffery. Um, although, to be fair, I don't know everything about how the FTC goes about regulating this stuff, at least under the advertising uh, cases, cheat death would not be a problem by itself. And it wasn't that this ad by itself was the issue. It was the entire marketing campaign. And the marketing campaign included all of these um, uh, descriptions of all of the great health benefits that you would get from Palm. In fact, this ad that I clipped in here was actually a lot longer and had a whole bunch of descriptions of the things that it could do. Yeah, and I think with, with something like cheat death, that's probably going to be... Um, more of a puffery type statement. I think the, the reasonable consumer is not going to think if they drink palm juice that they're never going to die um, and they're by cheap death. But I do think that, um, you know, in context, you do have to be careful with, with the FTC. Um, we focused this, this webinar on, on the Lanham Act and, and what uh, competitors can do in terms of false advertising. But the FTC is also out there and can take independent action and have broad authorities and, and the, the act is different and they don't have to do consumer surveys and the like. They can find that in their uh, opinion, something is, is false or misleadingly false, uh, even though it, it, it may even have some true statements. So it is another consideration that when you're looking at advertising, you do, do need to worry about the FTC out there as well. And if we can go to the next slide. So, this is another one where the where the context mattered in, in terms of the, the Pizza Hut and, and Papa John's. Um, and the, the lesson from, from these types of cases is that you do need to be careful about making definitive measurable statements uh, unless you have something that verifies that they're true. Um, you know, we've talked about pomegranate juice. If you say something's 100% grape juice or whatever juice, you better make sure that it is. If it's got something else in it uh, and uh, your competitor can measure that and test it and figure that out, they're gonna have a, a viable Lanham Act claim. 
So uh, if you're going to make a, a measurable statement, you need to make sure it's true before you make it and put it on an advertisement. Generally, subjective statements are, are okay. The, the king of beers we talked about, best tasting hamburger, um, best haircut, whatever it might be, those are going to be okay. Um, and even the line, uh, better ingredients, better pizza from Papa John's, the, the court in this case uh, thought that this was, uh, this was okay by itself. Uh, so if Papa John's was just putting out advertisements uh, for itself saying better ingredients, better pizza, that would be just puffery and would be okay. But it, when the court considered in conjunction with marketing that Papa John's was, was doing using fresh packed tomatoes, filtered water, et cetera, that became, became more quantifiable. And so in that situation, when you get into what the ingredients are and you start describing them and just said, instead of using the phrase better ingredients by itself, you end up with something quantifiable that can no longer be considered puffery, but may be considered misleading in context. Now the court ultimately um, found the slogan wasn't material to consumers. So this is a situation where you're not dealing with a, a measurable, literally false statement. Um, there wasn't a, a, a situation where they didn't use filtered water. Um, if you have that situation, then there's going to be a presumption of materiality because if they were using non-filtered water, they would have a literally false statement. But when you're uh, having these statements that are closer to puffery, but they become quantifiable, maybe they're literally true, but could be misleading. That's when, if you're a competitor suing over them, you're going to have to show their material to consumers. And you're going to need to, to, in general, do that with a consumer survey which can have their own set of problems. So this is a good example of where you, uh, you may have a situation where you're literally true, you, you could be misleading, um, it may get you sued, so you'd rather not have that happen, certainly because that gets expensive, but it was a situation here where they were able to prevail in the lawsuit uh, because uh, Pizza Hut in this situation couldn't show that the statement was material to consumers. Um, but it's, it's better to be careful and, and make sure if you're making statements like this and then you're linking them to things that could be quantified that uh, you may wanna rethink them so that you don't end up in a, in a lawsuit with one of your competitors. And to be clear in this case, Papa John's was claiming that it used fresh packed tomatoes and filtered water, which was true. They also were claiming that their competitors like Pizza Hut were using tomato paste concentrate and tap water, which was also true. But ultimately the court concluded that this could be misleading to consumers because none of these things probably made a difference as to whether the pizza was, was quantifiably better or not. And so, Ultimately, and then as, as Sam pointed out, ultimately the court concluded that none of this was material to consumers anyway. If, if all goes wrong, you've gone through all your, all your advertisements, but you've still ended up in litigation, then there's some early considerations to think about, such as, you know, what is your competitive injury? If you are the plaintiff who is suing, what is the issue? The case is easier if the parties are direct competitors. If your direct competitor is either making claims about their own product that are false or about uh, comparing it with yours. Um, but even as we mentioned before, even an indirect in injury can be actionable, even if you aren't direct competitors, but you make a component used in uh, something else that competes with them, uh, that can make a difference. Or uh, as we saw in the puppy food commercial, there are situations where uh, the market can be so distorted that even if you're not direct competitors, if you are otherwise in the market in this area, it might be distorted in such a way that you've actually been harmed by what has happened. Um, also look at whether the challenge statements are obviously untrue. Uh, either this is if you're either the plaintiff or the defendant. The presumptions, a lot of presumptions kick in for literally false statements. So if the, if the statements are not literally false and you're the plaintiff, then you're going to need proof of deception, materiality, all that kind of stuff. Um, and those kinds of things typically require uh, consumer surveys or don't require surveys, but are typically shown with computer, excuse me, consumer surveys. And then finally, look to who is the intended audience for the statement. That can affect the level of sophistication required for a consumer survey. So for example, in the 
Budweiser versus Molson case, you've got the consumers are beer drinkers. Generally, what are beer drinkers going to think about that? Beer consumers are going to think about that versus an advertisement for, say, a drug product that you're advertising to uh, physicians. There's a, sort of a can be a different level of sophistication between those those groups. Yeah, and I think to, to follow up on that, um, part of what you're going to want to do if you're the plaintiff in that situation, you're going to want to be looking at um, what is measurable, what can you have measured before you file a lawsuit so that you have your, your experts and things lined up even before you proceed. Uh, as a defendant, you won't know that you're being investigated, although in highly competitive industries, you probably expect that a lot of your advertising is being scrutinized by your competitors. So it is a good idea if you are going to have measurable statements that you have, you have tested them out, you have made sure that they're true statements, um, and you have some backing for that, um, that, that you, could, you could produce and defend yourself with. Um, you know, continuing on with the key takeaways for litigation, the early considerations are looking at what is the competitive, are looking at the, the theory of damages if you've got a competitive injury. Um, so if you, if you think about that, what is the easiest case to establish? Those are going to be direct competitors. Um, but even in, as we talked about, an indirect injury can be actionable. Um, for you know, example, a component manufacturer can be injured by, adver by advertising, making false claims about the ultimate product. Um, are the challenge statements obviously untrue? So these are where you're going to get to, to kick in for literally false statements. And then if we, if we talk about damages, I'm on the next slide. Because these are what lead to the, the, the damages. So the damages, um, as we mentioned before, you can have your actual damages for lost profits. Um, those can be directly established by the false advertising. Perhaps you've lost customers and you've lost numbers due to the competitive injury that we were just talking about. You can establish that you've lost a number of product sales. Um, you can then get your own lost profits. Um, so you want to look at that as a plaintiff even before you're filing the lawsuit. Uh, you should have your own information and know what the impact is to your own customer base. Um, you also know that you have disgorgement available. So even if you can't establish your own um, lost profits, your own lost sales, that you can uh, get disgorgement of the defendant's sales. And you probably won't know what that information is at the time you file the lawsuit, but you do know that that is something that you can establish. You do need to be prepared that if you don't have a situation where there's a uh, false statement that you can show, that you can prove that you're going to have to establish materiality and you're probably gonna need a consumer survey to establish that. Um, maybe there's situations where you'll have some evidence of actual deception um, from a statement that, that is literally true, but just misleading. Um, you might have, have situations where consumers are coming to you, but that's going to be unusual. Uh, so you're going to need to think about how you're going to establish a consumer survey and probably want to do that early uh, in the case so that you can find expert uh, that's appropriate, you can develop and design the survey to make sure it's going to be admissible. Uh, surveys frequently get tossed out for a variety of reasons. Uh, and surveys can be expensive. So you want to make sure that your survey is, is useful and defensible and done to appropriate standards within the, the district court and the circuit that you're, you're litigating in. Another key thing to think about, obviously, uh, early in the litigation is whether to ask for a preliminary injunction or not. As you all know, preliminary injunctions can be challenging and costly to obtain. Um, not all judges are interested in doing this, this amount of work and thought kind of early in the case. Um, and also, it can be very challenging just to make all of the proofs that you need to make early in the case to be able to obtain a preliminary injunction. But if there's irreparable injury to the plaintiff from ongoing use of the advertising promotion, whatever, um, then an injunction may be the only avenue for the competitor to, to be able to stay in business. If it's, if it's dire enough 
that it's difficult for them to even continue on as long as this false and misleading information is out there affecting their sales, then the injunction may be the only avenue for the competitor to stay in business while the case winds its way through the federal court system, which we all know can, can be a lengthy process. So you have to think early in the case about whether it makes sense to seek a preliminary injunction, um, and particularly if the plaintiff is suffering existential injury from the ongoing um, advertising campaign or labeling, whatever is the actual uh, the actual issue. You know, I think in a situation where we, we have, the courts are starting to come back uh, to life, but they're going to have to deal with criminal matters and different kinds of backlog that there may be a reason to go for an injunction, a preliminary injunction uh, in cases more frequently now than there, there was in the past, because it may take a while to get to trial. I could see trial times in various district courts being delayed, depending on where you are for a year or two years. Um, longer than what they would have been. So it, it may be a situation where you're going to suffer a great deal of irreparable harm. And although going for a preliminary injunction isn't a sure thing, there are going to be situations now where you're going to want to go ahead and pursue that just because it's going to take much longer to get through the court process uh, for the next couple of years than it would have a year or two ago. And so if anyone has any questions, we're nearing the end of the hour. We, we answered one question. We're happy to answer more. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll be sending out uh, MCLE forms or CLE forms for people. And uh, if you'd like to have the slides, just let us know. We're happy to make the slides available. Yeah, thank you all very much for joining us. All right, I think that will, uh, we will wrap it up. Everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you all for attending.